could you could you you'll know each other so maybe yeah. you could just introduce yourselves and and then okay. well, that's going on and then so it'd be useful yeah. for me to understand who you all are um okay yeah okay okay so uh, i start um i am panagiotis uh, with a difficult surname for foxiliotis a greek one okay um I am uh, the deputy director of our organization, the, the deputy director of uh, the scientific team of uh, the daycare center of our organization. Um, I have studied occupational therapy and uh, also I hold a master's degree, degree in uh, adult education. Uh, so for the past uh, one and a half year, I'm responsible for uh, running the the daycare center of, uh, of, of Fergus City. So I don't know, uh, Mr. Duffy, if, if you want some uh, extra information about our organization. Yes, please. Yes, just explain okay. how the organization works and who you support. Okay, so our organization is called uh, the Association of Parents, Guardians and Friends for People with Intellectual Disabilities. Uh, it was established uh, about 42 years ago in uh, 1978, uh, 43 years, um, from parents. It was a, a, a parental movement, which is, is, it is uh, very usual here in Greece in the terms of uh, rehabilitation for people with a disability. Um, uh, at first, uh, our association focused on the, um, on the occupational uh, rehabilitation for adults with intellectual disability. Uh, they established a daycare center uh, in 1982, um, uh, which provided services um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the vocational training area for adults with intellectual disability. Uh, at this time being, uh, we run um, um, eight uh, workshops, as we call them. Uh, uh, we call them uh, where we, we provide uh, uh, vocational training uh, in uh, different uh, areas like uh, weaving, uh, pottery, uh, pasta making, um, um, what else? Uh, uh, gardening, um, uh, general. Um, uh, um, oh, help me, somebody. Fotini, help me. Um, uh, what uh, What uh, do you want to say, Panagiotis? Uh, the other workshops we have, I have. Το τμήμα των αρτοσκευασμάτων το είπαμε. Ναι, in English, help me. A brand, brand uh, factory uh, or... Uh, yes, something like that, okay. Something like, yes. And sweets. Okay. And cookies. Bakery. Okay. Bakery, bakery. Bakery. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Bakery. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, and uh, after many years that um, we were in, the, in the, that area, um, we, are, we the, the parents and the, the scientific team realized that uh, uh, there are some uh, new needs in the and uh, this had to do with the, with establishing uh, supported living uh, residency. Um, we were the first in Greece that uh, we established uh, a supported living house uh, at around 2006 and uh, at this time being, Bing, we, we operate uh, five uh, re residences which uh, offer uh, supported living services uh, for about 42 individuals with intellectual disability. So that's a, a brief uh, description of, uh, of our organization. Christo. And who, who else is here with us now? And what so uh, it's also Mrs. Pasco, uh, who, uh, who is a psychologist. Uh, Fotini, a few words uh, from you. Hello, uh, my name is Pasco Fotini. I'm a psychologist. I hold a master degree in, on special education. I'm working um, about um, eight years uh, to Ergastiri. Um, 
I do not know what else uh, uh, do you want to, to know good. about me? <laughs> That's good. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet okay. you. Uh, it is also with us, uh, Mr. Pailopoulos, George, who is also a psychologist. George, you should. Okay. Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm, I'm George. I'm a psychotherapist in Ergastiri the last uh, 13 years. Uh, also, I have a sister with mental disability, so I'm in the field uh, the last uh, 38 years. <laughs> so I hope that everything will be very useful. Okay, thank you. And also, uh, Evangelia and Sophia, and, and Sophia, a few words uh, from you. Hello, can you hear us? Yes. I'm yeah. Evangelia. I'm an occupational therapist in Ergastiri, around uh, seven months now. I'm quite new. And, uh, and I am Sophia. I'm a physical education teacher specialized in disabilities. And I uh, work here uh, approximately three years. Okay. Yeah. And uh, nice we to have. Meet you. Nice. Okay. And. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we have also another Panagiotis with us, um, uh, who is also a psychologist, but uh, he's responsible for um, um, uh, for one of our uh, supported living residencies. So, Panagiotis, uh, a few words from you for yourself. Hello, hello from me too. Yes, Sue. I'm glad to meet you, and I'm uh, waiting to, uh, to to follow this webinar. Okay, and uh, okay, uh, Panagiotis, uh, just a, a short uh, description uh, about your duties in our organization. Yes, um, I organize uh, all the activities that the beneficiaries. Uh, do in the their house, um, and we uh, do the, uh, how can I explain that? Panagiotis, um, please uh, help me. Supported living uh, houses. Uh, um, you are responsible for uh, uh, for one of our five uh, uh, yeah. houses. Okay. And... Uh -huh. uh, we do our vacation. Uh, we organize. Uh, daily routine, uh, daily life skills, um, I think uh, many more. Uh, and you support them in uh, psychosocial terms? Uh, yeah, yes, also? From, my, okay. from my profession, uh, I work uh, with them uh, in a psychosocial uh, context and psychoeducational context too. Okay, thank you very much. I think also uh, George Bogut is, is with us, but uh, I think that he has a problem with his microphone. Uh, he is also one of our uh, physical educators in uh, physical trainers in our organization. So I make the acquaintance for him. And uh, that's from us for okay. now. I hope that somebody else also will join us. So. Andreas and uh, Mr. Duffy, uh, you, can we continue? Is it okay? It is for me, and you can call me Simon. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Simon, do you, should, should we also introduce ourselves, do you, do you think? Sounds good. Yeah. You, you want me to go first? You go first, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so my name is Simon Duffy. Um, uh, I haven't really thought about how to introduce myself, but um, I run a um, think tank, so a little institute um, in the north of England, in Sheffield, uh, but I am also um, run this global network called Citizen Network, which uh, Puzzle is part of, and my work really for now 30 years has focused on how to advance uh, in english we talk about citizenship but really it's the it all goes back to the greek concept of being a citizen being an equal member of the community um, 
most of my working life, less so now, but most of my working life has been with people with intellectual disabilities. And I worked in initially in supported living, but also helping people move out of supported living into homes of their own um, and move out of day centers into jobs. And, uh, and also, which is the topic of this conversation, started to help people take control of their own support. Um, and so I led changes in uh, London, and then I set up a, a new support provider in Glasgow, in Scotland. And then I led a change process in changing government policy um, in England and Scotland towards this, the term is a bit ugly, but we talk about self-directed support. So help that is really driven by the person. And um, that led to some important legal changes, but the legal changes came after the practical changes, which is it really important. The law always follows good practice. It doesn't set good practice, at least in my experience. And, and I've worked internationally around these ideas. So I've worked in Australia and New Zealand and America and Canada, um, Finland. I supported uh, organizations in Finland who were able to get a change in policy towards self-directed support in Finland in 2016. Um, and I'm now part of a European project, two European projects. So the project Andreas and I uh, a, a part of is called uh, the SDS Network. It's an Erasmus Plus project, um, which is about teaching people about self-directed support. So this is what this is about now. Um, but also another project which is uh, funded by the European Union to establish new standards for funding models for the whole of Europe. So how is social services to be funded in the future? And uh, the European Union now is starting to think that all social services should be funded using self-directed support approaches. But that's at a very early stage. So we've got, you know, but it's, it's been real progress because um, when I started to talking to friends in Europe about this idea five or six years ago, people were a little bit worried by it but things have progressed and now the European Union and organizations like EASPD and the European Aging Network are behind moving towards user-centered funding, funding controlled by the person or by people close to the person. And so, yeah, I'm here to try and share some experiences but mostly to try and help you think about whether this is something you really want to explore in your organization. And uh, so mostly to try and help you answer any questions you have, um, or at least I don't know if I'll have answers, but um, uh, certainly to try and um, offer some thoughts or some advice from experience. Andreas, what? <laughs> Uh, thank you. So, um, some some of you may know me, some of you may not. I, I'm uh, Andreas Papp from. I'm representing the social enterprise called Puzzle, uh, in which we are aiming at uh, every level of uh, social inclusion, mainly for people with intellectual disability. But we are also uh, taking on other uh, crucial topics. Uh, personally, I am trained in the easy to read method, and my goal is to bring accessible information to as many uh, administrations and services in Greece. Uh, during uh, this project, uh, we are taking on the procedure and how we can apply in countries like Greece, where it's not so much um, progress 
on the self-directed support and how to personalize services and give uh, people with intellectual disability the, the freedom to uh, choose uh, the services upon their interests or talents or needs as active citizens. And uh, also talking with uh, both uh, Panagiotis, but uh, with Simon also, we would like further on to combine the self-directed support model, but enhanced with the information in an accessible way. So, so we really give this uh, freedom to a person with intellectual disability to choose, but also to read and understand by him or, or herself of what she's choosing. Um, there are other topics also puzzles taking on. I mean, we, we try with the uh, with the employment issues. We try to create learning material of uh, how a person with intellectual disability can approach an interview for a job. Uh, what are the needs from uh, uh, from different companies to uh, to take as an employee uh, a person with intellectual disability? Um, you, you can, if if anybody is interested, you can find it on our on our website. Uh, what um, what are our actions? But today we're discussing about uh, self direct support and and the European project that we are in. So I will, I will make a, a very quick um, introduction before I give again the to Simon. Can I share my screen, Simon? Yes, I'm... You should be able to. Okay. I'll just, uh, yeah. Can you, can you, can everybody see my screen? It's starting, yes. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, the skills project, it's about uh, improving skills of people with intellectual disability and changing uh, their lives. Um, as we already said, self-direct support has many goals, but I have highlighted for this particular discussion two main uh, that uh, the disability support systems move away from an institutional approach and towards a more personalized and uh, always keep in mind the UN Convention of uh, Human Rights and try to take each article of the convention and make it a practice and not only uh, in theory, because we have seen in many cases that people with intellectual disability cannot really um, ca cannot really achieve and can cannot uh, live based on the on their human rights that have, all countries have agreed on. And the second thing is that. Uh, people with intellectual disabilities can obtain the freedom and, and uh, in our case, the assistance in order to advance as active citizens and part uh, of uh, our societies, which in Greece uh, at a very large percentage is excluding them. Um, so the current situation about the self-directed support projects we see that in some countries, good systems may exist, like in, uh, in England or in Scotland, but uh, they are limited to just some groups. We don't see a more broadened uh, application of, this, uh, of these projects. Uh, in other countries, in, and we see it in southern countries, uh, like for example in Italy, uh, we see suitable laws that may exist uh, but there's really no awareness or know-how of how to apply in a, in a self-directed support model. Uh, in other countries like Germany, they have, uh, they have good projects and they have, uh, they have implemented some good ideas, but they, these projects need to be tested in the, long, in the long run and need, of course, an expansion. And in some other countries, 
the self-direct support plan is not existent. We as Greeks can choose in which group we think we <laughs> we are part of. Uh, I think we all agree uh, at which bullet Greece is. Um, the target groups that this project, uh, the self-direct support network project, is aiming is social workers who assess needs and uh, develop uh, support solutions, like many of the professionals here today, uh, managers like Panayotis and service providers who can adapt their way of working to support self-direction. And of course, in order to bring and implement a project, you need to have decision makers and system leaders who will give this opportunity, will give the, the, the ground uh, for us to uh, apply uh, the self-directed support uh, model. Uh, so one of the topics and one of the Greek um, agenda that was raised was how can SDS be developed for people with mental disabilities? And are there approaches for this target group? And um, we could, uh, Simon, could, do you agree? Should we take it question by question and uh, see, yes, see how, how, how this progresses? Yeah, it's okay with you? Yeah. Do you want me to, so that very first question really, how? No, no, we, we can take the questions afterwards. I'm just laying out the, the topics that I have uh, created based on the both the discussion I had with uh, Regastiri, but also based on the discussion we had as southern countries uh, during the the project. So I could I could present first all the questions and then later on you could uh, take on the rest of the yeah okay. So uh, the second uh, topic that was raised was how to implement self-directed support systems. And uh, the question is, how is a person-centered project constructed uh, in other countries and what values does it have? We could talk about the legalistic approach, we could talk about the social approach, or in the different kind of context, we could focus on what is more uh, important for us uh, as a Greek uh, side. Uh, different kinds of, of difficulties. We see that self-direct support, many, uh, especially here, is portrayed as a discrimination against people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, and the question is, how can we overcome this? How can we, uh, how can we censor and then later on overcome this? Uh, difficulty in order to really bring the self-directed support plan uh, in our country. Uh, stereotypes, of course, is another major difficulty. And um, I lay out the questions that were raised again. What is the experience of overcoming social cultural uh, stereotypes for the development of SDS? Uh, as we know, stereotypes is a uh, a major barrier that, especially in our field, in the field of intellectual disability, we see it in every aspect and in every idea we try to bring to the table. Every innovation has to face a certain type, this short uh, way of thinking and uh, not uh, looking on the in the long run what an idea can bring. Um, and of course, this was a common question with the Italian side or that we see that the, within the convention, we see this, uh, this term regional accommodation being mentioned again and again. So one question that was raised was what is the relationship between an, S, an SDS and self-directed support plan and uh, this term, the regional accommodation that is mentioned in the convention. Uh, 
So these are all the questions I've gathered. Uh, Simon, you have the freedom to take on the conversation on how, however, uh, however you want. Okay, let's... Uh, I, I, I will keep this shared, so if you want to go back and forth on, on some topic... Well, I've got some pictures as well, Andreas. Oh, yes, so, so I'll stop sharing. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, maybe I'll just say a few things to begin with. Yeah. To put this into this international context. So, yes, if you stop sharing, I'll share that um, so yes can you see that so this is a, a, a map of we've done a little bit of work in the project actually just trying to understand what's going on in different countries um, but self-directed support so basically the idea that it is people themselves who should control and direct their own support has been going on for, we think about the first example we can find internationally is in 1965 in California, a disabled man called Ed Roberts. By the 1970s, this approach had spread to people with intellectual disabilities. You can see examples of that in Canada and in uh, the USA and in England and Scotland. And you start to see the idea of personal assistance, particularly um, becoming more and more important for people with physical disabilities. But you also see the idea of uh, people having individual budgets grow uh, internationally. And so it be, it's, it's been a slow process though, that's over 50 years. I, I, it, strangely, the first example of personal budgets happens the same year I'm born. So I, know, I always know exactly how long this, this journey has been going on. So it's now 56 years. So the progress has not been super fast, but it has been consistent and it's part of, it seems to flow naturally from deinstitutionalization. And I think what we find is that roughly, first of all, we have this history of institutionalization that goes back many years, certainly um, to the early years of the 20th century or earlier, institutions start to develop. Um, people with disabilities are drawn in. Every country's a little bit different but most Western countries went through some kind of institutional phase. Um, then we start to see institutions closing, the big institutions, and we start to see the emergence of community services, but community services that are somewhat institutional. So often, a day centre, um, a place, a workshop, a sheltered workshop is a good alternative, often advanced by families. It's your, where you were created, very similar things were happening in England in the 1950s, creating family-based services that were in the community as an alternative to the institutions. And as the institutions started to reduce, these new services, community-based services started to grow. But those services themselves were also quite institutional. The funding really went into the service and people had to accept the service that they received. Um, in the last 20 or 30 years, I think people have more and more tried to break out of that model. So, at a very simple level, some people find this a useful way of thinking about the point, the shift we're making. Um, so the shift is on the left-hand side, sometimes call this the, like the professional gift model. So the state or private foundations gives money to professionals who provide services to people with disabilities, okay? And of course that seems okay, rational in a way, 
But of course, if you are the person with a disability, you have no real control over what you are receiving. You're receiving it as a gift, but it's a gift you can't return or you can't convert into something else. It's, it's kind of fixed. So the shift is towards this, instead, a kind of citizenship model. And in the citizenship model, really, we separate out the entitlement to support and the budget that goes with that from the actual supports that people receive. And we think about, it's not just about the money, it's thinking about the person as a citizen who lives in a community and whose life is part of that community. Whether that be where they live, what work they do, the relationships they form, you know, whether they're forming a family, all of these things should be open to people. And the, the money should be under the control of the person who then works out the kind of support that they need to live the best life that they can. Um, so we sometimes we think about trying to rethink what the, sorry, I'm looking for a slide here. So sometimes we talk about this, that this is a model called the keys to citizenship. So how do we help people live a life of purpose that's right for them? How do we help people have freedom so that they can follow their aspirations? How do we ensure that people have resources? Um, I'm trying to learn Greek at the moment, so I'm tempted to say the Greek words here, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure to make such a mess of it. But uh, spitty I can do, I think, spitty. So, you know, how do people have a home that's their own? How do people get help? Boethia, Boethia. Um, how do people have a life, Zoe, Zoe, um, that's theirs? How do they contribute? And how do they form relationships of love, agape, agape? So those are all normal things for everybody. This is not a disability model. This is a life. This is a way of thinking about what's important in life and then applying it back. So we think, how do we, how do we design support? How do we design funding arrangements? How do we help each other in a way that advances people's citizenship as I've defined it here? Um, I'll, I'll just one more slide and then I'll take the slides down and we can talk a bit more. But there are, every country has different funding arrangements, uh, different legal history, different culture. So every country is different and, and difference is good. At its simplest level, thought of as a kind of process though, self-directed support probably can be, um, also two people have entered, I'm just letting two people in who've joined. We can think of um, we can think of self direct support as first of all helping people get what they are entitled to. So, what are my rights? What am I entitled to? And then we can think about self direct support as helping people express their freedom. What are my plans? What are my dreams? How do I want to live? What are my problems that I want to solve in a way that's right for me? And then actually, how do we help people participate in community? Because community is where solutions are found. It's where life is created. It's everything, and communities are in this sense complex, but they are all we have. Um, and they include services, but they're not defined by services. And so, by combining what we're entitled to, by using what we're entitled to with freedom, by working in participation with community, that's how we build a life of citizenship. So we can talk about the human rights aspects in more detail, but roughly speaking, these are the kind of core pillars of human rights, you know, 
having rights, having freedom, being able to participate as an equal and being treated as an achieving citizenship. That's, that's the purpose of self-direct support. And you can see that things like how budgets are controlled by the person, how planning happens, how decisions are made, how people get access to community, all then become part of a particular set of solutions. And as I say, different countries, um, different countries have particular arrangements. But the key thing, I suppose, and maybe, and then Andreas, you might want to make me focus on a question, but the key thing, I, when I looked at your questions, the main thing that really hit me was the difference between if um, pragmatic innovation in your legal context and legal change. Now, both are important. So the fight for self-directed support has always involved legal changes, always. But it has always begun with people making practical changes, even with legal constraints. Does that, does that make sense? It, it's, it's not that the law answers the problem. We start behaving differently, and then we start asking for different um, solutions. Uh, we start asking for new freedoms or new ways of organizing funding. That has always been the way that self-directed support has evolved from the grassroots up to the legal changes. And actually, I think that's a good thing because legal changes on their own don't actually change anything in, in our experience. You can actually see examples of places where the legal changes have been very shallowly rooted. They've not led to change. Um, uh, like I would say Italy is an example of this actually, where we've seen legal changes, which mean that it seems like self-directed support is possible now, but nobody's doing it. Well, very few people are doing it because somehow the legal changes are just abstract they're not connected to anybody's practice so there's no understanding that that's an entitlement there's no systems to support the entitlement there's no demand on the ground for the changes because nobody's doing it andreas what what do you think um i should talk about or what question do you think or should we just encourage some questions for a little while and then? Yeah, I, I would like to just comment on what, what you said about what, what could happen in Greece or what should happen. Um, I think all, the, all this, the, the procedure of change you are describing, I'm always thinking of it when you're, doing, when you're taking an action, it's, I'm always thinking of the domino effect. You just have to, to choose you, you, what prioritize, what is the first marble you need to push in order to, to create this, uh, this chain. And um, agree, I, I, I agree that laws are brought into context uh, after the actions. There's some movement and some actions and some energy created that forces a new law or a law to be uh, transformed and converted into uh, in, uh, to include your actions and 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 make uh, make them legal so uh, i would i would uh, like to ask the co-workers from ergastiri what 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 should be the priority of, uh, of Greece now? What should be the first step in their opinion in order to go towards this? Because we see, we, we see this, um, this European air coming with the deinstitutionalization de process and the self-centered uh, 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 process. And we are fighting against 
um, the institutions and the institutionalized system that is uh, uh, current in our country. So what, what do the people think that should be the first step? Panagioti, uh, if you want to take the... Okay, I'm unmuted now. Um, uh, uh, it, it was very interesting and uh, I was sure about that. Uh, what I have to comment is that uh, I believe that uh, creating a law is uh, uh, from the state. It may be the, uh, the easier part uh, of, all, uh, of all the proced procedure. Um, what uh, I think crucial is, is, is the change of attitude in the field of uh, service providing for people with uh, disabilities. And uh, as uh, I said, our organization is a family-based one. And uh, Simon also um, uh, said that also in England uh, uh, about many years ago uh, from institutions, they, they went to family-based organizations. And what uh, I, have, I want to comment and also to, to put as a, a question, um, uh, how do we change, how do, can we change the attitudes of families towards, uh, towards uh, the, um, uh, their children, uh, their relatives with, uh, with, uh, with disability in order to, to promote uh, um, this, uh, um, this new uh, approach, which, which is our, um, also in, in, in the same state of play with uh, CRPD? like uh, the SDS, like self-advocacy, like uh, the personal budget. Uh, I think that it's very crucial. And afterwards, uh, about us professionals, um, how can we change our attitude uh, towards this, uh, these approaches? So I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show another couple of slides, if that's okay, because this, this is very important questions. Um, so the first thing is that <laughs> this problem is not new, of course, it, it repeat, it's on a repeat. We've had it about institutions themselves. So this graph here is showing you, um, actually something that's very common, which is just called the innovation curve like anything new goes through a process that follows this. Um, if it's successful, it follows this dark line here uh, to completion. And you can see, so we've gone through this with, in, in England anyway, we've gone through it with the big institutions. We went through a long period where institutions are growing, where the alternative, nobody believed there were alternatives to institutions institutions were seen as the natural state of affairs and anything else was weird, strange, <laughs> and, and not even being thought about. And then in about the 1960s, um, uh, led by families, led by families, alternatives start to become aware. People start to say, no, we don't want our son or daughter to go into those institute, those big institutions many miles from home. We want them to be supported in our community. So people start creating the first group homes, the first day centers, the first respite services in communities. Usually it's families, it's private money, it's not the state because these are seen as eccentric. Why would you want to do that? But then, after a while, these things seem to be much better. People start to get excited about them. And then the state starts to think, oh, maybe we're wrong. And so at the same time as these new community options uh, emerge, we see the first indications that people are willing to start thinking about closing the institutions. And, and then we went through a period that really began in the 1970s, but still took till 2010, so that's 40 years, took us 40 years 
to close our big institutions. Yes, so they started to close in the 1970s. I think the first one was closed in about 1988, uh, completely closed. And then the last one, big one, was closed in 2010. We still have some small private hospitals, so we haven't really completely killed off all the institutions, but we're close. <laughs> we're close. So that's that's a typical innovation curve, and 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 it, and it does go through standard phases. Now, if we think about self-directed support as a new innovation, a new wave, it's going to be quite similar. We're going to have period of, and this is what you find, is that people start to create forms of self-directed support, often not things that are recognized by the state or recognized by the big professions, but individuals, families, communities start to do slightly different things. And, and then the more advanced service providers, the ones with the more better thinking, the better thinking professionals, they start to do the same. They start to create new models, even when the law isn't quite right. But then they start to have, then there's a conversation about the law and the law starts to change and the system starts to catch up. It's quite challenging. We're even in the, I think John O'Brien said to me that probably the state in the United States that has gone furthest, has made the most progress is California. And California is where this started in 1965. So time is obviously an important factor here. It really does take time, Paniotis, it's, it, and there isn't a button for changing attitudes. Um, but I think we know a couple of things that are worth thinking about. So just, sorry, this one isn't translated into Greek. But if you think about the normal curve, um, you know, most people, most people will carry on doing things, even things that are not that great, um, just because everybody else is. Does that make sense? Like, we are, as human beings, are um, not always very brave. We, we, we will... If, if every child is going to a special school, then we will send our child to a special school. If every person with an intellectual disability is going to a day centre, then we will send our child to the day centre, or our son to the day centre, or our daughter to the day centre. So, in a way, the system normalises what is normal. Um, we, that's, that's, in a way, the constraint. What we've seen, and again, a lot of this is led by families, in my experience, but it's usually families who are often not, um, that they're, they're at the edge of, um, they're, they're off doing their own wild, crazy thing. Uh, I, can, I cannot believe that there won't be families in, Greece now, who, who probably constructed a solution for their son or their daughter, doesn't even come close to a person. They probably improvised something. Then there will be families who are in the current system, but they're not happy. But somebody's left their microphone on. Uh, sorry for this. Uh, I, I, I think we have a, a problem yes. with the sound. Yes. It's only for, from, for me. Ah. I think it was Vasilis. <laughs> I've muted Vasilis. That's better, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it was Vasilis. <laughs> um, so, the, so a lot of the change in my experience comes from the extremes. Sometimes people who are doing their own crazy thing, wonderful thing, and sometimes people who are very angry. In fact, when I was working in um, Scotland in 2000, 
yeah, the year 2000, I was, I'd, I'd helped people leave an institution, but we did it in a radically new way. So ev every person who came out of the institution, we said, you've got your own budget. And as they came out, we said, let's help you find your own house, your own support arrangements, your own decision-making arrangements. Let's organize everything individually. And that worked really well. And then I started to act as a consultant for a municipality, a um, place North Lanarkshire, which is like quarter of a million people to the um, east of Glasgow. And they, were, they brought me in because they had they'd done some good um, deinstitutionalization, but they found that they were working with a family where the family was, they said, the family is causing us lots of problems. The family is very angry about everything. Uh, Simon, can you help us um, deal with this family? And I, I had a, I, we did a workshop together and I, and I got all the professionals and all the family in the room. And I asked the family to identify all the problems that they thought were in this service. And they came up with a long list. I think there was about 15 items on this list. And we put it on the list and, and they said, well, what's the most important one? And we went through every, every item on this list. And by the end, when we got to item 14, every one, the professionals actually had to agree with the family that it really was a problem. They had to accept that the family was looking at this correctly. They tried to ignore the problems, but these were real problems. Uh, and the 15th item, interestingly, the, the mother said, oh, I'm going too far there. <laughs> that isn't really a problem. So she scrubbed that one off because she'd been listened to. After the session, I spoke to the director of the whole service, the whole system, and I said, you know, why are you having these fights with families? What, why, this is a great family. They love their son. They care passionately about their son's well-being. Why don't you give them control? And that began the process that enabled me to get the municipality to change its system. So we worked from that first family through to eventually changing the system and the law in Scotland and other things, yes? But it actually started in a way with an angry mother. So um, what am I, so I suppose Paniotis, I'm saying that the, you, your questions are correct. What, but, and then what is the strategy? Well, a strategy is to follow the normal curve from the sharp ends. You, you have no other way. Uh, I don't believe you can train people really to have the right attitudes. Uh, people learn through listening to the experiences of other people. Um, and a lot of learning is really has to be at a peer to peer level. So families learn from other families. The family that take makes the innovation, you want them to teach the family that is a little bit frightened of the innovation to take that step. Um, so it's a, it's a cooperative process, not a systemic process. It's an organic process. And it's the same for professionals. There are professionals uh, who have a little bit more courage, a little bit more vision. I think you are probably those in Greece. That's why Andreas has brought you together. You're the ones with the vision. And you will, uh, it will be hard, but when you start to make the changes, then you will bring other people along with you. When people see that it works because that's the brilliant thing self-directed support we're not doing it because it's the new label or thing to tick we're doing it because it makes people's lives go better and when people see that people's lives go better they get excited and they're prepared to change their attitudes and their beliefs but it history so far tells us that takes time and you have to start somewhere 
and then you have to follow that process through all the time with the the self-directed support network what we're trying to do is accelerate learning like if we can create peer support globally if we can link through citizen network organizations together if we can encourage mentoring and support then we can increase the pace of of learning and innovation that's that's what we're working on at the moment internationally um, but Eve, whatever we do, whatever systems we set up and create together, it's still going to take time. It takes time to have courage. It takes time to do the work. It takes time to see the results. And it takes time for that to then be seen by the person who didn't believe it. Oh, no, that's never going to work. You know? But those people are always going to be in the majority in the early days. So you need a bit of belief and hope to work through. Sorry, I, I, yeah. Does that does that help at all? Yeah, it, it helped a lot. Um, the curves also so 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 to us the uh, uh, how things uh, are going in Greece in in several areas. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, it was clear for me. Um, I, don't, I don't know if any of uh, my colleagues uh, have any questions according to what we are saying right now. So uh, you guys feel free to, to express your questions. You can also um, uh, do it in, in Greek and uh, uh, Andreas and me will translate to, to Simon. So, do we have any questions? Yeah, George also, I think. Ah, okay. Oh, yes, I'd Hello, like George. to ask you, we discussed about the families, but what about the persons with the disabilities? For example, the self-advocacy story, what can we do? Yes, no, very excellent question. So, this, in a way, the same thing is true. Um, I have a friend uh, with intellectual disabilities called Wendy, um, she was the first person to have a, an individual budget, we called it. Um, first person with an intellectual disability to have an ind individual budget in, um, in England. And um, she, she's actually like, likes to train people, likes to tell people about what she's done. She's been very creative. She and I are working on a book together at the moment. Um, self-advocates get this very quickly if you um, if you can bring people with intellectual disabilities together um, and I know that's a, a complex group and there are people with more communication difficulties but there are people with intellectual disabilities who will get this they get it because when you when you think about the kind of life you want Everybody has got dreams. Everybody's got things that really matter to them, but don't maybe matter the same to everybody else. So if you start to offer people a way in which their support can change and their, the path they're on becomes their own, it works. And the same principle works for learning. People listen better to people they think of as like them um, and I would say that's it working with self-advocacy in your organization is is probably the best strategy what you want to try and avoid is it's very easy for these kind of categories self-advocates families professionals to come into kind of false conflict of course, there's always a professional who is a problem. Of course, there's always a family who are a problem. Yeah, a problem in, it's to somebody, um, that's human life. But most professionals want people to do really well. Most families 
love their children and want their children to flourish um, and will listen to a son or a daughter who starts to say, you know, I want to try something different. Um, but a lot of it is about having courage and security. So you need to find the courage inside, but you also need to create systems that help people feel a little bit safe. Often what we do, one of the reasons why it's very hard to change systems is that we, we almost say, no, this is how it works here. If you, if you go outside our system, good luck. <laughs> there are no, we, you can't take anything with you. You've got no rights, no entitlement. So it feels frightening. You can't. So if you want innovation, you try and make it safe for people. Let's try this. I'll, I'll tell you another little story, which was important for me. Um, I, I was brought in to uh, work with a lady who lived in a, re a kind of large residential care home. And the service was saying, this lady, uh, Nan, uh, she's, she's too able to live here. She really should move out. We keep telling her we can help her get a flat, um, but she keeps changing her mind. Simon, can you help her make up her mind? Which is a strange, um, strange thing to be asked to do. And anyway, I, I went to meet Nan and I asked her some questions about her life. And I discovered that Nan was an excellent shopper. Like she's poor, like most people with intellectual disabilities, but she would go into the part of town she lived and she would, she would look for the best deal before she spent any of her money, yes? And I thought, well, this is funny, isn't it? Because all these people are saying, oh, she's indecisive, she can't make her mind up, or she changes her mind. And, but here's somebody who's an excellent shopper. So I said, well, why don't we change our approach? Why don't we help Nan think about what all of her options are and then say to her, when you're ready to decide, we will help you achieve what you want. So that's what we did. We sent a day or a few hours um, and we, we actually drew up a, a big piece of paper for every option. We drew a picture, we described the good things, the bad things. And then I put that in a little, she had some reading ability, little reading ability, but I put it in a kind of simple accessible book for her, just printed it out and said, right, think of, take your time and think about it. And when you, when you uh, have made your mind up, give me a ring and I'll come back and we'll, we'll try and make it happen. She rang me up. And, but what she said is that the option I've chosen was one that was on the pictures, but nobody had taken seriously. The option she'd chosen was to go to a new house with her friend, her friend Christine, who has Down syndrome, and nobody thought was ready to leave. But Christine and Nan decided, no, we're going together. So the option she had was really not the option the professionals were planning because she wanted a friend. She didn't want to go. She didn't really want to live in the, in the institutional group home, but she didn't want to live on her own. She wanted a friend. And so did Christine. And they went and did that. And we, once they'd made their mind up, it happened. I think that's, <laughs> sorry, Georgia. So that's maybe a long story, but for me, um, this is about respecting people. Yeah, respecting their ability to have a plan, to think about things, to take time, but then also supporting things in a way that's right for them. And it, I, I noticed how the system, the system had decided she should leave. And it was the system that had a plan. And it was saying, no, now, this is about Nan's plan, her plan, her vision. And then we can make the actions. And that 
obviously then was more secure for her and she was clear and it happened. That's how we've got to think about it. We've just got to respect every single person as a citizen <laughs> no, in a way. And we know that for every single person with intellectual disabilities, we may have to be more creative about planning, about understanding, about exploring options. So it's not a simple go to the shops and pick from a shelf, no. But still the basic principle is the basic principle of humanity. You respect the person, you respect, respect their integrity, and then you, you go on a journey together. Uh, I, I would like also to add something on that because I, I'm happy that uh, Jorgos brought up the self-advocacy because um, in, my, in my opinion and from hearing this, uh, this story, we understand that we may create tools and we may uh, provoke system changes, but I think that through self-advocacy, we should, we should use self-advocacy as a quality check of what we are bringing. Because as you said, the system made her move, but without thinking of what, what she really wants or needs you have to make this move and you have to be, you know, placed there. So, so self-advocacy and especially within organizations, it should be used with, with campaigns and, you know, we have to really listen uh, to what uh, uh, people with intellectual disabilities want. And therefore you, br you bring the changes. We have the tendency and many professionals of the of the field uh, globally have the tendency to say, I have a, a very nice idea and we can do this and we can do that. But where is the where is the, the comments from the people, from the beneficiaries? We we very, very easily forget about this. So I believe in every aspect, uh, if it's DI or if it is SDS we should also bear in mind that self-advocacy will be there to really give you the thumbs up if you're really doing a significant change for me and the change in my terms, not in, in your terms, because the changes you're going to bring on the system will affect my life. And, the, and, the, and this goes to some of your questions about stereotypes. Yes, of course. In, in, in my experience, when somebody with intellectual disability is on a platform with a government minister and they explain why they want control, it's very hard for the government minister to disagree. And their experience of seeing a self-advocate ask for freedom, ask for rights, is part of the, what changes attitudes. Uh, the treatment for attitude is experience. <laughs> your, your attitudes change when you start to see people in new light, in a new way. You actually come together. And so this exploring self-direct support is a great opportunity to change attitudes. Attitudes will be a problem, but it's also an opportunity to change those attitudes. So, can I add something? Can I ask another question? Okay. So, so I would like to ask, are there any uh, specific tools that uh, we can use that um, in, a, in a long term period that we can uh, promote uh, SDS in our, in our services? And uh, also I will come to uh, one of our uh, main questions that uh, uh, Andreas uh, noted before, what about the, the equality uh, among the disabilities? It's different to provide, to provide services in a person with a motor disability and uh, it's uh, very different to, pro to provide services to a person with, with a, a severe intellectual disability. Uh, are there any practices? Uh, can you um, tell us some examples uh, for people with a severe intellectual disability 
um, with, who they have obtained the, the SDS uh, approach. Yeah, why don't I do that? Shall I share a couple of stories, real life examples? I've got a, I've, I'll use again a picture. So, um, yeah, sorry, just picking a, and most of the work that I did was with people with severe intellectual disabilities. And in fact, in legally, in England, we had a change of law in 1996 called direct payments. And direct payments allowed people with physical disabilities to take the money instead of the service and then purchase their own service. But people with intellectual disabilities were excluded from that legislation. Um, later, the law changed a little bit the exclusion was taken away in law, but there was no real examples of people doing, people with intellectual disabilities uh, being in control until we started to show that actually it was possible by practical examples in communities. And then we were able to change the law again so that the law changed in 2014 so that now in, in theory in England, the reality is a little bit more complex uh, and not so good. But in theory in England, everybody with a disability, whatever the disability, is meant to get a budget and then is meant to be able to control that budget. But it took us a long while to change the, that system and change the law. But here's an example from going back to 1997, when the law wasn't really any good to us. But what we did was we were creative within the service provider. So I was running a service provider at this point. Um, so I had a job a bit like yours, Paniotis. <laughs> Apologies. Um, and my job was to get people out of the institution into their own home. And we were we were being asked to support really the most challenging people in the institution. Um, Patrick was somebody who had severe intellectual disabilities, autism, a partially sighted, and, um, but also had developed really quite dangerous behavior. Um, I think it, the records for Patrick are, were very poor in the hospital, um, but examining the way he behaved, it looks likely that he was probably sexually abused in the institution. And, and so he had a lot of anger and would respond to small things would trigger very, very dangerous behavior. So, so Patrick was described to me it, as the second most challenging person in the whole institution. So we, uh, Patrick couldn't use many words. He, he um, in the hospital they said, he only had one word and that word was toilet. Um, when he moved, we did the planning with Patrick though, we, we really tried hard to get the planning done, not in the hospital, but with his family. So we brought Patrick out of the hospital and we sat with Patrick's family. And it was, it was interesting that the first time he came to his sister's house, he sat down and said, drink. And it was really interesting because obviously in a hospital, you never ask for a drink because the, the drinks just come when they come. So obviously the word was there, um, but uh, he never used it. So his vocabulary was a little bit bigger than people realized. But still today, and again, Patrick is, I always know how old Patrick is because he's exactly the same age as me. So he's, he's now 56. So he left the institution in, in 1997. So he's been out 
a good long time now. So the beginning of it was really, really important to plan with people who cared about Patrick. So that's one of the first things I'd say. So for somebody with a severe intellectual impairment, of course, they can't tell you with their words what they want. They can tell you with their behavior things that are important to them and things they hate. And so you can look at their behavior and learn a lot. But still, that will only take you so far. So you really need to find the people who care about this person, which was his family. Even though he was in the institution, in many ways, the, the family had been tricked into allowing him to go to the institution in the first place. That's a longer story. So the family, they cared and they, and they knew in their heart and their head what was important to Patrick. So we did the planning together and we tried to get the family to think. Again, it was, and this goes back to what you said earlier, Paniotis. So although the family loved Patrick and cared for his well-being, they found it very, very hard to imagine a, po a more positive future for them. They wanted the son, their son to leave the institution, but they couldn't imagine a positive community support for their son. Um, and they had a stereotypes about um, what community services were like. So they were very frightened that he would be put from the institution into a block of flats in the center of Glasgow and expected to have a good life. They, they just couldn't imagine that. And I kept saying to them, no, it's all right, we can do anything. We can do anything, let's figure out what's, and that didn't work. So one day I said, right, imagine we have a million pounds. Tell me the house and the living arrangements for Patrick if, if we had a million pounds. I know we don't have a million pounds, but just imagine we had a million pounds. Help me. And they, they imagined a house that was in a, not in Glasgow, but near Patrick's sister, and Patrick and his sister lived on the west coast of Scotland, so about 40 miles, 60 kilometres from um, Glasgow. And he had a house of his own uh, with four bedrooms so that uh, he, he could have, his family could stay over and he could have staff, at, but he also could have somebody else living with him, not somebody with a disability, but just somebody who would be our flatmate. Um, that's where he lives now. <laughs> um, we, we were able to buy a house like that for him, not for a million pounds. It was, it was really affordable. It was well within the budget that was being used as part of the deinstitutionalization process. We had to be legally creative, but we, we were able to do that. We constructed a team made up of, we, we actually had a limited budget. Our services didn't get any more money than the services for people moving into group homes. So we had, to, we had a very limited budget, but we had to be very creative with Patrick. So we did have some staff who were employed just for Patrick. And that was very important that the staff were recruited just for Patrick because every single member of staff had to understand him. They were trained in what was important to Patrick, what to do if Patrick got angry, all the details so that we minimized all the risks. But we also recruited people from the community to be flatmates with Patrick. And this was because we wanted Patrick to have people around him who were living an ordinary life and who could make sure that Patrick didn't feel kind of imprisoned in his home. Um, and, we, and we also, we chose a site for the house, which meant that he could easily go for long walks and things he enjoyed, and, uh, but also he had lots, lots of space and freedom. So, uh, and Patrick is, is doing really well now. I mean, and, and that's, that's um, maybe that's enough talking. I, I can tell more stories, but, 
that's a story of somebody who definitely would be described as having not just severe intellectual impairment, but se severe challenging behavior. And designing individually, to me, is the only way you could have supported him. So self-directed support isn't just some, I don't know, exciting, new, positive thing. It's also how you support people who are really difficult to support. Because you need to make, it's those people who, where you need to make everything flexible. You need to get everything right around that person. You need to pay attention to every detail. It's very hard to do that in institutional services because the institutional services has to work for most people. But what works for most people would not work for Patrick. Does that help? Yeah, it, 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 helped, uh, it helped a lot. Um, uh, we have uh, some uh, steps here, here in Greece to, to take in order to, uh, to focus on this um, uh, person-centered uh, approach, the individual uh, approach. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, yes, it, it, it is uh, obvi obvious the way, the way that, uh, and I'm happy that, um, uh, that you made the family to, 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 uh, to, um, to take place in, uh, in, in the decision, that you had the family, um, you didn't try to, to exclude uh, uh, the, the family at all. No, you, I think my rule of thumb, do you have that expression in Greece? My, my general experience is that mm -hmm. um, things go a lot, lot better with the family on board. One in a hundred is the bad family. One in a hundred. Even, even the slightly dysfunctional families are better they add value, they add love, they have fire. You really got to work to bring families with you. Families are where the love is and professionals can bring lots of things, but really it, they're, not, they're not going to be there for the whole of that person's life. And I think it's very dangerous to create a war between families and professionals. Um, it, it, it's nobody's fault, really. It happens everywhere. But, oh, if, if you can overcome that, if you can bring families and professionals together around and kind of underneath the person so the person can flourish, that's when things go well. And that's, that, I think, has to be at the heart of every design. Um, but, it, you know, every time you've got to be thoughtful because... Every family is different. Every individual is different, and professionals are different. I, I was I I did a talk or not? I was listening to a somebody else we got out of a hospital. He was giving a little talk on video last week, and uh, I was remembering that when we were helping him leave the hospital, I had a planning meeting with him where he said, "I don't want that nurse in my planning meeting." So you know, he had people he had to exclude. He was more able, of course, but uh, that was a very difficult conversation. I had to go and say, well, Huey doesn't want you <laughs> having anything to do with his plans. He doesn't trust you. He doesn't want you. I'm sorry. Don't take it personally for whatever reason. So you, you, have, to, you have to think, uh, again, you have to respect the person, though. It is their life. And I think if you work with them, and you pay attention to them, you, you, you will want to bring their allies together. And sometimes that means, yes, working with people who maybe don't have all the right language or the right ideas or, but if they've got love, then you'll be okay in my experience. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's clear. 
Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, how should we move on? Do, do we have uh, any other questions? Hello. Ah, okay, Evangelia and Sofia. One minute to put a... Um, we were inspired um, um, by your speech, so we had an, uh, an idea and uh, we wanted to ask about your opinion. What would you consider um, as a first step to create a questionnaire uh, in order to understand their um, their favorite activities and let the our um, our students our students to choose the beneficiaries yes the beneficiaries to choose their favorite activities instead um, evaluating them and put them in uh, different classrooms or uh, courses wouldn't it be better to promote uh, the freedom and all all these uh, values that you talked about to let them choose their favorite courses well yeah, i think yeah. that that kind of choice is very important i did i a few years well 20 odd years ago i worked with three day centers so maybe they're a little bit like your organization i don't know because i've not been to visit you but these were three uh, day centers quite big day centers and we did something a little bit like this um, we did a kind of big person-centered survey, but we, we didn't just ask um, which courses that we're currently doing would you like. We asked people, would you like a job? Um, what do you like to do with your time? Uh, you know, do you want to spend time with your friends? We asked people about everything, really. And so it was a strange thing because it was kind of person-centered, but it was holistic. And um, I remember when I analyzed all the results, what was clear, I think, was that, so this might be relevant to you. Um, when you thought about individuals, there were some things that people wanted to do that um, really, they would need some kind of individual support. They were very personal to them. Some, so, some, so they weren't about choosing a course. It was about what they wanted to do with their life in their community. Yes? So mm -hmm. that was a, one part of what people wanted to do. Then there were things that people... Um, actually, one of the things a lot of people valued is spending time with their friends. Just as, So actually what they valued about the day center wasn't what they were doing, but who they were with. So again, it was very important to them that they would have the capacity to be with their friends. So it was important that we, they thought about how that happened. It wasn't necessarily important that they were with their friends in the day center, but it was very important that they were with their friends and that they had a place where they could meet and do things. And then there was a third category these were things that people wanted to do, but they, that it made sense to do it with their friends or with their peers. This might be like learning or it might be like leisure or anything. This category of things, it was not clear that those things were best done in the day center. Like people, some people wanted to go and do bowling, you know, bowling with their friends. Now, there was a kind of bowling system inside the day center, but the bowling exists in the community. Um, so it seemed more like it was a matter of how do you support people to do what they want in a group of friends um, in the place they live. Mm. So I think you could build on your idea, but you can also go further. And if you start to talk to people with um, self-advocates and people with intellectual impairments and families about all of the options, maybe you won't be able to achieve everything. It's hard, it's work. You have to think, how 
could we change the way staffing is organized could we change the way the budgets are organized how are we using the building or our buildings yes there are lots of things but i do think actually surveys um and, and considering the results of those surveys is a perfectly sensible way of going. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But you can, you can probably go like deeper, open your eyes to what, what is possible. I, I thought it was interesting because financially you could see that it was affordable for people uh, to have a, a person-centered approach because not everything, like in a day center, obviously resources are grouped and people, everybody's getting a, a fraction of all of your salaries and <laughs> everything's locked together. So you think, well, individualization, we can't do that. But if you, if you kind of rethink it, you might find that there's quite a lot of things people actually want to do in groups, but they could choose to be doing. And if you rethink it, you might find actually there is some resource we could make much more individual. And there are some things we could do which are more collective, but we could do them in a different way, in a different place. We can use our community in, in a more um, exciting way. And some of the most interesting things at the moment, I work with a group of uh, people with learning difficulties and mental health problems um, who have really created a very low cost system of peer support. Most of the good things they do don't really cost anything because people help each other. So if the community comes together in a different way, you can really do quite a lot of creative things um, with peer support. It's somebody else who will help somebody or together they will organize something in their community. Um, so I think that self-directed support is also should not be thought of as merely individualized. It's in, in a way it's, it's, it's most powerful when people actually start to come together, but in a creative way. Uh, Andreas is also involved in a project called Day Centers Without Walls where I mean, it's been a little bit difficult, hasn't it, with the, um, the COVID restrictions, but we're seeing examples of, of that kind of community creativity coming from day centers as well, thinking about people as citizens and then thinking about how they play their role together and how they play their role in community. Um, yeah, good question. Sorry for I talk too long. Apologies. No, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure for us to 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 to, to hear you. Uh, it, everything you say is, is is very interesting for us and and important, I think. Um, so um, we have a question from uh, Panagiotis Kataroupas, but he has a problem with his uh, microphone, and uh, I'm uh, I'm waiting to 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 write it in the chat box. Somebody's doing that, I guess. Yeah. I mean, uh, while, while we're doing that, the, the issue of Panayotis, you talked also about tools. And mm -hmm. um, I would say at this stage, um, there are probably a very few standard tools that apply very well in your circumstances. I, I really struggle. I can, I mean, there are tools for big service chain. I can, you know, there are things about budgets and that are, I actually mm -hmm. don't know that that's very helpful for you. I think, I think to make progress, you will almost have to look inside yourselves and, and, and like eventually and Sophia's idea, come up with some strategies that allow you to explore what self-directed support might begin to mean for you and for the people you're working with. 
Um, I think what we can do is link you up with, there are some very good organizations who've been on a similar journey. I, there is an organization in Cincinnati in the USA that I wonder whether we could create a link between you because I think they're one of the most inspiring organizations who've made this journey from being a day center to being something radically different. Um, but I think it's a journey and um, I don't know whether they have capacity to help you as well. So, but I think we can find you mentors or friends or peer organizations to compare notes with and I can help for a while as well. Um, but mostly I think you'll have to find your, look at your own context. Um, that will be perfect. Um, uh, is the question there? No, I can't. Yes, yes, I have a question. He sent it to me in a direct message in Greek. Um, so, uh, Panayotis wants to ask that, um, uh, that every approach, like uh, because uh, he was studying about empathy in the, the, the previous time, um, that in every, in every such appro approach, um, despite the, the positive uh, situations, uh, there is also a, maybe a dark side in them. So uh, are there any dark sides in uh, self-directed support? Any disadvantages? There's a, yes, well, it's, it's complicated, I guess. But yes, I think that's a fair question. I mean, one obvious dark side is if you look at this internationally, we, you find places where self-directed support is part of a journey towards greater citizenship, but you also find other countries where self-directed support becomes almost a bit like consumerism, like shopping for services and in a way it can quite easily lose its meaning in a world where yeah there's a lot of focus on money and and some powerful political and economic forces who quite like the idea of oh every problem will be solved you just go shopping for the right solution the market will solve the problem yeah there is no evidence that that's true quite the opposite markets don't actually seem to help. It's not really about markets, <laughs> but there, is, there are big financial interests promoting that kind of way of thinking. So that's, I think one of the dark sides is you, um, you do get people kind of radically misunderstanding this idea or converting it into a very shallow change. Um, and I think another dark side and I think this is a reason for you to act, not wait, is that governments start to implement these changes anyway as the new system, but often in thoughtless ways. So um, we're working at the moment with um, a government in um, Belgium. It's not true. They, they've implemented some nice system changes in theory, but they've had very, they, the people involved will admit that there's been very little positive change because all the changes have been really just imposed from the top. And so what happens is that people carry on doing what they were doing before. Uh, there has been no change in attitude or vision or belief you can kind of make the old system work the same, even with a new funding model. Does that make sense? If, if everybody kind of assumes, oh, well, I'm just, we're just doing this and we always did this and now we've just got to fill in some different forms and the money flows in a slightly different way, but really it's all the same. Then is it a dark side? It's certainly a wasted opportunity. It's certainly a lot of change with very little benefit. Um, 
And I think another dark side is that if it's done in the wrong way, you can leave people feeling more burdened. So many, I, I, if you don't provide the right support to people to be in control, then you can end up in a situation where people and families take more and more responsibility, but the securities are ripped away and that they're left more and more alone. Um, and I think that's why it's very important not to forget the collective, the benefits of working together. People, people do need rights and they do need the right to do the thing that matters to them, but we still need to have systems to uh, sec provide security and we still need systems to help people learn from each other. And we need, still need systems of advocacy the, in, a, in Australia at the moment, Australia went very quickly from a, quite a backward country where there's very little progress, high degree of institutionalization, to a massive system change uh, where the whole, a whole of Australia was committed to radical funding changes, everything individualized, supposedly self-directed support. Um, now, there have been many good things, quite a few bad things in that change. And the government now is trying to make some changes that many disabled people and families don't like. What's interesting, however, is because in Australia, they, they have worked out how to campaign together. So the fight between the government and people with disabilities is a public fight. Um, Australia has managed to turn self-directed support into a th thing that ordinary citizens in Australia care about. So they get good coverage in newspapers, they get good coverage in the media. It's hard for the government to introduce damaging changes <laughs> because people in Australia actually do think of this as something that's a, a common sense system that yeah, everybody should be in control. Everybody should have a good budget. No, we don't want, we don't want people in institutions. That's happened because people, families and professionals got organized, campaigned. They campaigned for changes that in a way they had very little control over, but they are still able to influence that through public debate. Sorry, that's again, too much talking, but it, so you you do need to think about these changes as complex and as being they are while they are if you like on the side of justice like anything they can be twisted they can be turned into something bad and that's why you need to to pay attention <laughs> to the detail get involved work together <laughs>